Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, from the Lord Jesus Christ on this, the 500th anniversary of the posting of Martin Luther's 95 Theses. Please be seated. Five hundred years. It's incredible, isn't it? I mean, to, to be sure, getting the actual opportunity to preach at a festival service for this anniversary is kind of like, uh, well, it's kind of like getting able to preach at the World Series. It's an incredible honor. My prayer is, with the uh, help of the Holy Spirit, I'll be able to throw some strikes and do some justice to this wonderful event for you fine, wonderful people here. My brothers and sisters in Christ, my fellow Lutherans. At the very least, I hope you get your money's worth. But what a joy it is to gather and celebrate our common heritage here that we have together in our unity of faith. And I know this is doubly so for you fine people. Right? How do I know this? Well, it's, an e it's a worship service on Sunday evening. You would only be here if you wanted to be. And thanks be to God for that. But you know, I think we should especially thank God for leading Martin Luther to nail that fateful document on the church door in Wittenberg. Still, we must remember that this is only the very beginning. This is just the birth of the Reformation. And we all know the great Reformation truths. As a reading from John has it, if the Son sets you free, and he certainly has on the cross, then you are free indeed. As St. Paul says, we are justified by God's grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And as David tells us, God is not a dreadful, irate judge, but he is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. You all know this. But in 1517, I don't know if Luther did yet. So here, who here has actually ever read the 95 Thesis before? Show of hands. Let's see it. Okay, we got a couple of you. All right. So, uh, well, this might next one make my next question even uh, different. But who here else has worked through the laborious labyrinth of Luther's explanation to the 95 Theses? One. That's who I was expecting, actually. One guy. Uh, and it was the guy I was expecting, Pastor Max. So, now, I'm not trying to shame anybody by bringing that up. See? I have to confess, I only read it to say that I did. Uh, but I also read it in part uh, to, to see for myself what I had always heard. You see, I had always heard that when Luther wrote the 95 Theses that he was still essentially Roman Catholic. And it's true. Turn to your front of your bulletins. You see this guy with tonsure and cowl? This Augustinian monk, Martin Luther, is the man who wrote the 95 Theses. At the, t at the time when he wrote this, he still believes in purgatory. He still thinks that there is a need for us to work off our sins and to purge that evil from us. In fact, one actually gets the impression that Luther's big problem with indulgences was that it just made everything way too easy. He still sees the Pope as the head of the church who's got a lot of good, godly authority and a lot of wonderful things to do and say. Luther actually thinks that these indulgent salesmen just kind of made up this stuff on their own in order to make a little extra cash on their side. And if the Holy Father, the Pope, knew about it, he'd squash it in a second. Well, he was wrong. Right? Now, to be sure, you do find Luther talking about Christ being our only hope for justification, but it's surrounded and overpowered by his talk on purgatory and the need to work off our sin. So long story short, in 1517, Luther was not yet Lutheran. Luther was still growing and maturing in his faith. And indeed, he never stopped. And my dear brothers and sisters, if we desire for Luther's work and his reformation to have continual meaning for us today. If we want to truly own our heritage as Lutherans, we need to do the same thing. We must keep growing in our faith 
and seek to live it out. Like Luther, we have got to grab a hold of the gospel like our life depends on it and run with the implication. But as you know well, so many don't do this. One way or the other, they end up failing. Today, I do think some just ignore the faith altogether. Certainly, they don't do this because of any sort of bad intention. But usually, there's this nagging fear that says that, well, it's the church is losing members hand over fist because our gospel message isn't quite relevant enough to the lives of everyday people. You know, although this is untrue, in order to stop this hemorrhage of members, congregations will ta tailor their message to the needs that people feel in their own hearts. And so the preaching of the church becomes not about Christ and His cross, but how to be the best you this very day. How to find your purpose. Ten steps to a better marriage. Seven principles for dealing with stress. And so on and so forth. And the church becomes a weekly help seminar, a weekly self-help seminar that serves subpar coffee. Now don't get me wrong, there certainly is a place for life application sermons, so don't get too mad at me just yet. I have myself have preached a fair share of them. But when that becomes the main thing and the only thing, because then something is brewing, trouble is brewing, because then Although these congregations do believe in the gospel, they just start to assume it, and they assume their people know it. They assume that the foundation is firm and whole and healthy. But as I've learned in my own foundation, over at the parsonage, a small crack can let in just a little bit of water and can crumble the whole thing. And then what happens? Well, what happened to the foolish man who built his house upon the sand? My sons will tell you in a heartbeat that when the rains come down and the floods come up, the house on the sand goes splat. So lest we go splat, we must ever attend to the foundation, doing the proper maintenance to it, to ensure that it's solid. In other words, we never grow weary, nor do we grow tired, and we never, ever stop speaking about Christ crucified in the fact that we are justified by grace through faith and the eternal life that that gives us all as a gift. To do so would simply be to so cease being the church. On the flip side, though, some also mistakenly believe that all we need to do is preach the gospel and never actually say anything else. Now, these guys are way better because they actually get the foundation right. But they never build anything on it. Now, you probably miss it because it's already dark, but we here at Emmanuel, just over here in this parking lot, have actually laid the foundation for a new building for our quilters. We've been waiting for some time for the rest of it to go up, and I know the quilters out there will tell you that they can't wait for it to go up. But what would you say if in their excitement, they took all their stuff that's been stored in our meeting room, their sewing machines, their quilts, their tables, the material, and they hauled it all over, put it on top of the foundation, and started to work. Even though the building wasn't built up. Right? You'd say they're off their rockers. And you'd be absolutely right. How much more is that the case for us? Because we're not putting up a building for quilters, but as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, we are, building a we are building on the foundation of Christ an eternal temple for the living God. And we build that temple with the life that we lead and the things we do or don't do. And when we understand everything that the Father has given us, and what a sure foundation that it is so sure, we have every reason to believe we're going to make it through Judgment Day. How could we not ornament that with the most beautiful, precious jewels and metals and make it a temple worthy of the living God. It's insane to sit on the foundation and congratulate ourselves and say, hey, look at this wonderful building. Isn't it nice? Thus, in our Lutheran heritage, there is a place for talking about living as though the gospel actually does impact our attitudes towards life, towards money, toward our time, our family, our work, and so on. 
provided that we don't actually ever end up ignoring the foundation, who is Christ. In fact, I actually believe that it is that temple building that is to grow in faith by clinging to Christ all the more strongly and seeking to live out the faith that we can show that the gospel is everything to us. Because when we do this, it gives the utmost glory to God. Because you see, to merely concern ourselves with the gospel and never build anything on it is really to make Christ not our Lord, but our servant. Now you guys know this to be the absolute truth, but we live in a consumer-based, service industry-driven economy. This type of economy just naturally forms people in a certain way where we look at everything as a service to be consumed. To be consumed for the needs that we think that we have. Even good Lutheran preaching can fall victim to this same problem. The gospel can become the service that I consume in order to deal with the need of a guilty conscience, and when that need is met, I can just go off in my merry little way, going to fulfill the next need. Now, don't get me wrong again, guys. I'm not saying that it's bad that we actually use the gospel to alleviate guilt. That's actually what it's for. But, when it becomes simply a service that we use and abuse, again, we're in trouble. It's becomes a real, a real issue for the church because the gospel becomes hollow and cheap. It leaves people with the impression that we can simply just keep on sinning and Jesus will keep on forgiving us on and on no matter what. And this makes Jesus out to be not our servant, but actually the servant of sin. And may that never be. For in truth, Jesus is not servant, but the Lord who redeemed you to be his own, filling you sad sacks of sin with his radical righteousness, so that now by his grace you are joined to his resurrection. You have been made into new creatures. You've been joined to Christ who makes all things new so that now you are saved by grace through faith, to do the works that God has prepared beforehand for you to do, so that now you can declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. So let your light shine before men, so that they can see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Truly, to Him be all the glory forever and ever with the Son and the Holy Spirit for justifying us, declaring us innocent of all of our sins through Christ. Truly, the only way to show that the gospel is all important for us is to live like it matters and actually changes us and changes who we are, for in truth, it has. But sadly, though, again, we know that that's not always the case. Right? People do abuse the gospel freedom. I know I can't believe you, anybody in the Lutheran group would actually think that. There are people who, who abuse the freedom of the gospel and they refuse to grow in the faith. And though they end up degrading the work of Christ and turn him to a huckster of a get-out-of-jail-free card, which is none other than what the indulgence salesmen were doing. And Luther's maturity brought him to this exact same realization. You see, for some years, Luther thought all you needed to do is preach the gospel. Preach Christ as Redeemer. But not preach Christ as the one who calls us to a new life of service. But then something call, happened called the Saxony Visitation. You see, Luther sent out a bunch of men to go out and look at the different congregations in the area, and what they found just absolutely just well, it appalled them and Luther. The people had abused the gospel and the freedom that it gives in some of the worst possible ways. Sin was just running amok. They found pastors who didn't even know the Lord's Prayer. 
They found people who were starving their pastors because for once no one was actually forcing them to pay. In response, Luther hit them with what I believe are his greatest works, the large and the small catechism. In the large catechism, Luther especially and earnestly pleads and even demands that Christians continue to grow in the faith by continually studying it, studying it and putting it into practice. This includes more than just the gospel, but even studying God's law as the guide for living the faith. Case in point is that the section on the Ten Commandments in the large catechism makes up 50% of that whole work. And Luther even goes so far to say that pastors who don't study the, the basics on a regular basis deserve to be run out of town being pelted with horse manure the whole time. So you guys are all in warning, right? As Luther found out, human nature is so fallen and so persistent that only a continual growth in the faith and a study of God's word and living out that faith can prevent us humans, and even then at best, from making a mockery of the gospel and sliding back into sin under the cover of freedom. Yeah, there's one other really good positive reason for why we should continue to grow in the faith, and I want you to imagine this scenario. Imagine that there's this this young man, for the sake of the argument, we'll call him Marty. Okay, Marty hears from his friend, who we'll call Phil, that there's this girl who really likes him. Now, Marty is this young man, and he's, he's starting to get interested in ladies, and he's looking to get into a relationship. Okay? So he goes to his friend Phil, and what does he do? He starts asking questions like crazy. What's her name? Katie. Is she pretty? Is she smart? Where does she live? What kind of family is she from? Hopefully we ask, where does she go to worship? What does she like to do to, for fun? What kind of music does she like? What's her phone number? Ad nauseum. And then finally, when Marty gets the courage to ask Katie out for a date, he'll keep asking her questions. Things from, what's your favorite color to what are your dreams and aspirations in life? Simply put, Marty's feelings towards Katie will naturally lead him to find out everything he can about her. This is simply the most natural expression of love. We too are in love with God because we have found out from a friend that he is in love with us and that his love for us is even stronger than the grave and indeed has conquered it. Our love is pure and holy. And so the most natural thing there is to do for us is to find out everything we can about him. We want to find out who he is, what he's done in the past, what he's doing now, what he's going to do in the future. We want to know about his character, his personality, what makes him happy, sad, or angry ad nauseum. And so it's no surprise that the hallmark of a person who truly loves God is the continual study of the word and steadfastness and prayer. So as you study the catechism, yes, avoiding that dung thrown in your direction, as you read portals of prayer, as you go to Bible study, as you serve your neighbor, as you hear God's word and, and hold it sacred and gladly hear and learn it, know that this is simply the truest way and the most natural way for you to express your love toward God. And it is how you live rightly as an heir of the Reformation, and it is a beautiful, fantastic inheritance. It is an inheritance which holds true to the wonderful gospel message that we are justified, declared innocent of all of our sins through Christ Jesus as a gift by grace. May we hold to it always. Now, Pastor Griffin has a German proverb that he quotes. Well, he quotes this constantly. It's this old German proverb that in English translates like this. Standing still is falling backwards. Yes, like Luther, we want to be able to say, especially today, here I stand. But to continue to stand there, we've got to move. We've got to move forward. 
So like Luther, we must continue to grow in the faith, clinging to him like our life depends on it, and then seeking to live that out every single day. To do so is to give the greatest glory to Christ, and at the same time it curves our sinful nature by giving breath and expression to the deep love that we have toward God, the love that he has for us from which nothing can separate us. Now I trust that all of us here tonight don't just want to remember and celebrate this heritage, but we actually want to pass it on to our heirs as well. We want the Reformation to ring out forever. So right now, I want, to pic I want you to picture your kids, your grandkids, your future grandkids. Without a doubt, you want them to know the gospel in the exact same way. You want to share with them in the joys of the resurrection to eternal life in a new creation. We want our descendants to celebrate Reformation 1000. This means like each generation before us, we must actually stand. We must believe that the gospel is the most important thing in the world and live like it. We must act like our church buildings are what they are. Sanctuaries for the soul and hospitals for the sin sick. We must ensure that our little corner of Missouri is as attractive to ministers and to church workers as it can possibly be by making their ministries an absolute joy. We must put our energy, our time, our money on the line to ensure that the next generation has the Word of God. Whether that be via Sunday school, whether that be through a family ministry that pushes faith formation at the home, encouraging our youth to enter church work, or even supporting formal Lutheran education, even if your congregation does not have a school. If you want the Reformation to continue, these are the things that you can do. But above all, pray. Pray that God would send His Holy Spirit upon us in this area as well as throughout the world. That He would bless our endeavors. Because your spirit, or your pastor rather, may throw on the fertilizer in his preaching and teaching. And you may water with your own study of the word and your good works. But it is only God, the Holy Spirit, who grants the growth. And he does. He grants it in some of the strangest places on earth. Like in the heart of an Augustinian monk from a backwater, no-name university in Germany. Which means that he can even use you in rural southwest Missouri. So brothers and sisters, continue to grow. Continue to grow together so that in our circuit we may hold the gospel that we are justified freely as a gift through Christ as the greatest treasure in the world. And that we might also live like it's true. Amen.